order the January 2017 meeting of the Kennedy Planning Commission. First order of business no, is approval of the agenda. Is there a motion to approve the agenda? Uh, approve the agenda. Is there a second? Second. Alicia? Commissioner Bennett? Yes. Commissioner Kerr? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Risley? Yes. Commissioner Burnt? For sure. Commissioner Patrick? Uh, yes, thanks. Chair Lundy? Yes. I'm curious why you abstained from Well, I was not here for voting on it. Yeah. I beg your pardon? I was in the capital. This is the agenda. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Why would you care to change? I'm not yes, sure. Yes, I'll change. <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. You're thinking about more important things. I was thinking about something I was going to do. <laughs> uh, the second order of business is election of chair and vice chair for 2017. Is there a nomination for the position of chair of this commission? I would like to nominate Are there other nominations? I second chair. Are there other oh that's right, that comes first. Are there other nominations? Okay, Alicia? Commissioner Bennett? Yes. Commissioner Kerr? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Risley? Yes. Commissioner Burnt? Yes. Commissioner Patrick? Yes. Chair Lundy? Yes. And is there a nomination for the position of vice chair? I nominate Hank Johnson. Second. Second. Any other nominations? Okay, Alicia? Commissioner Bennett? Yes. Commissioner Kerr? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Risley? Yes. Commissioner Burnt? Yes. Commissioner Patrick? Yes. Chair Lundy? Yes. And now, consideration item three, consideration of minutes for the Planning Commission meeting of December 22nd, 2016. Does anyone have any corrections or additions? Okay, is there a motion to approve the minutes of December 8th? Not everybody's here. <laughs> I move to approve the minutes. I second. Uh, okay, Alicia? Commissioner Bennett? Yes. Commissioner Kerr? Yeah. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Risley? Yes. Commissioner Burt? Yes. Commissioner Patrick? Abstain. Chair Lundy? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, fourth order of business, continuation of the public hearing and consideration of Kennedy Academy request for a conditional use permit to allow temporary location for Kennedy Beach Academy Starting <coughs> School at 171 Sunset. Uh, oh, this is a continuation of a quasi judicial public hearing regarding that, what I just said. The applicant. Canada Beach Academy is requesting a conditional use permit to allow a temporary location for Canada Beach Academy Charter School at 171 Sunset. The applicant was previously approved for a conditional use, a conditional use permit, CU 15-02, which has expired. The property is described as tax lot 4800, map 51030DA, the property is owned by DDAJ Corporation slash James Investment Group and located in a limited commercial zone. Municipal Code Section 1722-030, conditional use is permitted, allows for a government use as a conditional use. The request will be reviewed against the criteria of the Municipal Code Section 17.80.110. Conditional uses, overall use standards. Does anyone object to the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission to hear this matter at this time? Does any commission member believe he or she has a conflict of interest? Does any commission member believe he or she has a personal bias? Has any commission member had any ex parte contacts? So, 
this, this is a reasonable place to make this um, point. Um, that site visit we conducted at 5.30 involved uh, Commissioners Lundy, Risley, and Patrick, um, and three people representing the applicants, uh, Kelly Dewey, Phil Simmons, and Bart Knott. And that's essentially an ex parte contact. Nothing illegal oh, right. or wrong about it, but I just want to state that for the record. Thank you. And thank you very much for letting us attend. And I guess that also counts as our site visit. Yes. Okay. <clears throat> is there a, a further staff report? Actually, since we didn't really do much of anything on this last month. Oh. Sure. Uh, this this written That's staff right. report is essentially the same as the one from last month, with the exception of I took note of the uh, request for continuance and the extension to the time limits that the applicants uh, did last month. Um, this proposal is, um, in essence, similar to one you approved uh, previously more than a year ago that has since expired. Uh, your conditional use permits are good for a year um, unless acted on. Um, this was not acted on and uh, died through inaction, so they are essentially starting the process anew with the conditional use permit. Uh, the other thing I would add is that um, you have a set of slightly revised plans here in front of you, slightly revised from last month. Um, the Design Review Board approved this in, uh, I know it was in March or May, anyway, last spring. Um, and um, their approval was based on a specific set of plans that are slightly different from this. Um, the DRB has its own process for reviewing minor or major modifications of to plans, so I, I wouldn't, as a planning commission, uh, get bogged down in that, except to the extent that it affects one of your criteria here. If there are design features that uh, influence whether the project meets or does not meet one of your conditional use criteria, then by all means delve into those design features. With that exception, I would say leave the design portions of this to the uh, Design Review Board. Um, I've had some discussions with them about the upcoming um, and the DRB approval, they, they'll either need to get a building permit before that expires or um, ask us for a minor modification if they need it. They, they may need it given the, the slight change, difference in plans from what the DRB reviewed and what they're in front of them now. The DRB is only responsible for exterior modifications, not interior modifications. I know we, the, the, the three of you that went on the site just saw some of the interiors of the building. Again, that's not something we're overly concerned about, except to the extent that it affects the criteria that you have to review to meet a conditional use permit, and those interior things are all uh, in play. Um, that's all I have. Thank you. And we received uh, correspondence by email, and we have hard copies here, and I gather there isn't any other Right, you, sh you should have an email from Douglas and Catherine uh, Craner, I believe it is, and from Tolvan Architect. Uh, okay, uh, this is the time for public testimony. The pertinent criteria to be considered are noted in the staff reports and listed on the criteria sheets next to the West Door. Testimony, arguments, and evidence must be directed toward those criteria or other criteria in the comprehensive plan or municipal code which the person testifying believes to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes appeal based on that issue. Prior to the conclusion of the initial evidentiary hearing, uh, we did that. We made an extension. That's correct. You're on that extension now, so it's not, if somebody requested an additional extension, it's not mandatory that you grant it. But we, it seems to me we have in the past or something, but. Yeah, it's all kind of, to, de depends yeah, on the so situation. And, yeah. Yeah. Persons who testify shall first receive recognition from the chair, state the full name and mailing address, and if appearing in a representative capacity, identify whom they represent. Is there a presentation by the applicant? Yes, sir. 
Phil Simmons from uh, Archcape. Kelly Dewey, piano teacher at Spring Insolvency. And Barb Knopp, post office box 658. Can we get the, uh, I'm, I'm sure we have them from before because we have the mailing addresses that, again. Okay. Sure. Uh, mine is 79805 Fire Rock Road in Archdale. 877 Canada Beach. So, good evening. I want to start, uh, I introduce myself. I'm the director of startup operations. So, I, I, I'm the one uh, who's going to open the school this fall. And for those of you who may be aware, it's been quite a journey. We've been uh, at this for uh, five or maybe six years now. Commissioner Risley has been uh, aware of it. Uh, but it. It's taken us some time, and, it, and uh, we finally got to this point. Um, and I, I really, uh, I'm here uh, to answer any questions that this commission may have. Uh, has, uh, as the chair mentioned earlier, this, or actually as uh, Mr. Uh, uh, Barnes noted earlier, that this commission approved the request last time we reapplied. We, we were ready to start last fall, and there were some issues with uh, the district, the Seaside School District, that precluded us from opening last fall. They're kind of technical, uh, but those issues have been resolved. And so those issues are no longer in front of us. We're now ready to open this fall. And frankly, it's just a matter of getting the permits and, uh, and, and opening the school. And so I, what, what I want to focus on and remind you of is that this commission approved the request a year ago, and there's no legally significant difference in this current request. It's the same request uh, with some, uh, as has been mentioned, some slight modifications to the floor plan. But everything um, significant about the last request is contained in this request. Uh, as the staff report noted, uh, we, uh, he went through the six criteria and noted that each of the criteria were met. I, I believe it to be the case. Um, I, I wanted to address a couple of things. Um, there's some correspondence uh, from uh, apparently one of the neighbors. I, before the last meeting, I, uh, I went and knocked on doors on just south of Spruce. I knocked on uh, everyone, anyone who would answer along the street just south of Spruce. I think I must have talked to four different folks. Uh, everyone I spoke to was, was uh, highly encouraging. They all thought it was a great idea. I, I didn't speak to the folks uh, in, in, who wrote the email. I will note, though, that the concerns addressed in the email, I don't believe are a concern for our proposal. Uh, our school will not operate in the summertime. Uh, we end in uh, early June, and we don't start again until after Labor Day. And so the peak time for business, we're not going to be in operation. Um, and we're not in operation on the weekend. So the, 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 key, the peak traffic times, we're not going to be operating school during peak traffic times. And, and perhaps more important is we have sufficient parking spaces in the lot. And we're paying rent, and part of that rent includes uh, parking spaces. And, and, and we will direct that our staff park their vehicles in the parking spaces. So I don't, and we will also direct any any parent volunteers who show up to attend or see, spend time with their kids. We will direct them to park in the parking spaces. Um, I, I I don't believe I understand the concerns and they're valid concerns, but I am confident that our operation of the school will not uh, will not be a concern for this uh, or be, will not interfere with these concerns. And uh, if you have any questions that I can answer, I'm happy to. Otherwise. Uh, the president may have some thoughts as well. I, I think you pretty much covered it. As far as the parking, we will make sure that our staff and, and parents park in the reserve spots and in that parking lot. So I think Bill pretty much said all of it. So if you have any questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Uh, I don't know whether this is, has come up. I, I remember that in dealing with parking questions for that neighborhood, uh, there was a question of where delivery trucks park, and I know that by the liquor store and the copy and fax, there's some, seems to be there's a sign that says that you need more space to park over. <laughs> well, it's now going to be your parking lot. Uh, Mark, do you know, actually, any of you know whether the, the city is satisfied that uh, if, if the 
this is not going to create parking problems for, for deliveries. Well, the, the code is, um, well, from, from a code point of view, we treat both, they have two separate parking lots and we just treat them in the aggregate uh -huh. with the aggregate of the uses of the building. Although, you know, liquor store clients or um, customers are more likely to park there than at the um, East End and um, surf shop uh, patrons are more likely to park at the East End rather than in front of the liquor store. But we, we just treat them as a, an amalgamation of all their parking and count them uh, in total. The calculation on page two of the staff report um, indicates they have 28 spaces and a total need for about 20 parking spaces per our code. So it's they're actually um, pretty generous in that regard. The part, the the loading part of this is is not addressed. The um, the school doesn't generate a truck loading requirement yeah. per se, but it, but it does. Um, to some extent generate bus and drop off needs. The bus already parks in the, the park. It stops in the red zone on the north side of the school, uh, opposite the fire department. Curbs painted red there. That's a no parking area anyway, but the buses can park there in the morning. Not park, stop <laughs> very briefly in the mornings and the afternoon for drop off. And then the parent drop off area isn't really a parking need requirement. So um, uh, they can do that in the street or in the parking lot without ch changing this count. That doesn't mean that the site plan, uh, there's a requirement that the site plan, plan be adequate for all those um, needs. And if if you find that the drop-off needs aren't adequately met, then uh, you ought to drill down on that. But in terms of the numbers, they, they hit them. So you're saying that they couldn't designate those parking spots? with a painted um, area that said for school? They could. Uh, the, the people at that building, the manager, the owner of the building could assign those spaces. They couldn't, um, uh, it couldn't be, well, they could be less or more than the number required for it, but you couldn't, uh, it's a 28 car lot, let me make an absurd example here, they couldn't assign 28 spaces for the school because their other uses need spaces too. So they can't do it in a way that would imply that those spaces aren't available for the other uses. But they, if there are particular spaces they want to reserve for the school and they don't um, negatively influence the provision of spaces for the other tenants, then yes, they could assign parking with signs or paint or something like that. And since we are starting just K-2 the first year, we really don't have a whole lot of staff. So I would guess maybe- We have five staff. We have five staff. So, you know, starting small, we, we don't necessarily need to reserve that many parking spots, but still be small. The question I have, that relates to the last time I saw this project. Um, when they referred to the play area uh, as a, it was reminding me of an old style prison exercise yard. Um, but I let it go. And then uh, on the plans I'm looking at today, you have at one end your a new play structure. What is that structure going to be? I'm sorry, I don't, I don't have the plans in front of me. Um, but here's what I can tell you. Our, our intent for physical activity, so part of the curriculum in K through five is a physical education. So and that includes both classroom uh, teaching on the subject, you know, health and fitness, as well as actually physical education, where we, we, the kids do stuff to get their heart rate going. Um, our plan is to do two things. When the weather permits, to have the kids recreate off the premises. In other words, there's a beach that's uh, two plus blocks to our west. You know, it's a short walk to the beach. So when the weather permits, walking the kids to the beach at the recess, great chance for them to experience our beach and get their heart rate up and get some exercise. Uh, there's a trail that runs due south um, up into the park there. And there's other trail, or there's other, there's, there's there's plenty of, of ways that we can recreate or get the kids' heart rate up and exercise without being in the so-called prison yard. 
Um, and, and, I, and I appreciate the, uh, the euphemism. Um, on inclement weather days, our intent is to, is to get the recreation, to get the heart rate up, get the exercise within the classroom, and which, which is common uh, for charter schools. So, uh, so we, I'm, I'm not worried about that. Okay. My concern is what the structure is going to be. So my understanding of the plans is we are not going to have any kind of play structure in that area along the south portion of the property. So there's a fence line in the very south portion of the property. Then there's the building, and there's a space of uh, maybe 8, 10 feet between the building and the fence line. That space is going to be for ingress, egress. That's the purpose of that space. There's, that space is not going to be for recreation. So uh, on the plan, you have a new play structure. It sounds like a judge would be is that one of the criteria? So, 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 let me address this. I'm, I'm kind of our plan tonight. Uh, David Benita was planning on showing up tonight. He's our architect. Um, he was called away, and his associate was called away. So, if David were here, he could better answer that question. From my position as the, the director of startup, I do not. We we have not budgeted for a new play structure. So I'm not intending on buying a new play structure. So I would ask that this commission disregard that block because I'm not gonna, we're not going to buy a play structure. It's not in our budget. And also, I, I'm just, our, that's not really our, well, our, that's not one of the criteria, how, whether they like the playground or not. I mean, I don't no, think no, 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 that's not, that's not the issue. You know, I, I, I'm looking at the space a lot of there and wondering what, what that structure is going to be. And the reason I'm wondering is because although Cannon Beach and, and the state of Oregon have not adopted playground standards, uh, the federal government has uh, playground standards that are followed generally by most schools, and they require six feet around all sides of such structures. And that's, that's the reason I bring this up. I appreciate that. And, and, and again, I, I apologize that, that Dave is not here, but I can tell you that we are not going to have play structures in that area south of the building, north of the fence line. That area is for ingress and egress. That, that's how we're running it. So we can just remove that please. from the Yes, sir, please. Thank you. Thank you. Are there presentations by proponents? Are there presentations by opponents? Is there a staff response? Nothing here. And since nothing has happened in between, I gather there is the applicant doesn't wish to make any additional statements at this time. And is there any reason to think that the hearing is being continued? Okay, so the hearing is not being continued. I'm closing the public hearing and moving to consideration. Well, we approved it last time, and I think we should approve it again. I don't see any reason why we shouldn't. Nothing has changed. It's changed a little. Well, nothing right, has right, right, right. right. already been yeah. you know, right, right. but. But we're not, not the new committee. However, we do have the right to you know, look after the safety of the, the structure you know, and if it's appropriate for its use. I think we can assume, though, that they were going to follow the, the law in building the structure. I mean, I, I would. Well, there, there is no. The federal law. Well, I, I would hope that, too. And all I'm saying is that. I think we need to have that as a condition. That they follow the federal laws for safety? That the, the, the standard safety recommendations of the feds be applied to playground structures in here. And, I, and that really determines what size of a playground structure you're sitting at in the corner. Mm, well, I yeah. I'm happy to argue I, with I don't have to 
comply with federal safety laws. I mean, yeah. I have a bunch of interest in law. I just did it. Safety laws or guidelines or what? They're, they're OSHA guidelines. Mm -hmm. And um, I just happened to you know, think about that when I went out and looked for Oregon guidelines and I didn't find any. And uh, then I came across the OSHA guidelines, which make a lot of sense. Yeah. And I think that that's something we do have the uh, right to expect. Okay, I move that we approve this with the caveat that they follow the OSHA guide, guidelines for um, safe playground structure safety. Second. Okay, is there further discussion? Um, Mark? So the, the way I think this would play out in terms of um, me enforcing that condition would be I, I'd look to the um, applicant or their representative, the designer, to say, give me some documentation that shows that you that this playground structure, for instance, meets the applicable OSHA standard. If, if, it, when they have, if, if, if that does show up in the, yeah. in the permit. So that's that's the way I think I would handle it on my end. Is that, okay. is yeah. that what you have in mind? Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm, I'm curious, considering that having, having just been out in that corner, uh, and it, it's cert certainly not tiny, but it's not very big, uh, it's probably, it's going to be a fairly small structure. Is that something, assuming that, as we're told, uh, it's not included in the original construction, is that something that they're going to need to tell the, the city or anybody else if they're putting it up in the future? Well, it, interestingly, I, I don't have the design review packet in front of me, but um, I think that it was part of the design review board's approval. So um, if they're dropping it, that that is one of several little modifications that they're going to have to make, that they are making to the site plan. I'm talking, only talking about the exterior now. Yes. Um, and the design review board has a process for reviewing administratively what are called minor amendments. Mm -hmm. And I'll have to ask the chairman of the design review board when I get this full, complete drawing, um, whether these are minor or major. If they're minor, we approve them administratively. If they're major, they would require a trip back through right. the public process at DRB. I was actually asking the, the, the opposite question of assuming that this is a, approved without any playground, jungle gym or something, if they want to put one in later, are they going to even have to tell the city about it because it's going to be a pretty small structure? If it's, I, I, if it's not bolted to the ground, then it would be more like a picnic table and the answer would be no. But I believe most playground structures that are going to be used in a public setting like this are going to be permanently affixed to the ground. We have issued building permits on, on other um, things like that that are permanently okay. affixed. Yeah, I think they'd even get insurance if they if they went to the ocean that it went anyway to the school. They have to have that. So okay. are we ready for a vote? Anybody want further discussion before a vote? Okay, Alicia. Commissioner Bennett? Yes. Commissioner Kerr? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Ridley? Yes. Commissioner Burnt? Yes. Commissioner Patrick? Yes. Chair Lundy? Yes. I should have the, uh, the decision document out tomorrow on this. Okay. Let's just give you a call. Well, we have the signature have sheet that. here. I should have the, the, okay. the packet mailed out to the the parties tomorrow. short-term rental permit 
administration, enforcement, inspection, revocation, and standards. The request will be reviewed against the criteria of the municipal code, section 17.86.070.A, amendments, criteria. Does anyone object to the jurisdiction of the Planning Commission to hear this matter at this time? Does any commission member believe he or she has a conflict of interest? Does any commission member believe he or she has a personal bias? Is there a staff report? Yes, thank you. Um, this has a um, kind of a long, complicated history, and some of that's covered in the staff report. I, the one thing I didn't mention there is I guess I'll remind you, in case you've forgotten, that we last year brought an amendment to you um, asking you to move the short-term rental code out of Chapter 17 into another chapter um, for a variety of reasons. You recommended against that. That would have been a legislative change, just like this one that required council approval. Um, staff asked you to approve it. You recommended against it. I took it to the council. They agreed with you that proposal is dead. Um, as a result of that, uh, this amendment is coming back through you, even though short-term rental permits are not normally something you that, that come before this commission, actually that ever come before this commission. So um, it's still part of our zoning ordinance though, so uh, amendments to this code section still go through you. And in the same manner as, as other amendments, uh, hearings and uh, recommendation from you were forwarded to the city council, they hold hearings to make a decision on it. The, this set of amendments in front of you are um, what I would characterize as primarily procedural. They are intended to address a directive we have from the city council um, to uh, simplify and clarify some things in the, the short-term rental ordinance. Um, most of these amendments were drafted by Tammy Herdner, the city attorney. Um, I'd asked her to be here tonight. Prior engagement prevented that from happening, um, but she wanted me to um, urge you that they were, for the most part, um, procedural amendments, um, not substantive. I'll get back to that in a moment here. Um, there's, there are other things going on in the short-term rental program that we're handling just administratively ourselves to try to meet this council directive of simplified things. We're changing some of our forms, um, some of our procedures, um, the way we do a number of, of, of things we do to administer that program, inspections, new permits, renewals, those are things, things that we don't require ordinance changes we're already working on. So these ordinance changes don't sit by themselves. They, um, they, they are related to other things that are happening administratively here. Um, that said, there are some, uh, some changes in here. Even though I would characterize them as administrative, I wouldn't call, call them minor. They, um, they do have an impact on the permit holders here. Um, two of those things, to my mind, stand out. One is the change to enforcement. The current enforcement uh, mechanism has uh, kind of a cascading uh, effect. Uh, the first violation results in a warning. The second in, uh, goes up to about six, I think, before you were suspended. This would shorten that up. The reason for doing that is that we, um, uh, I believe this was written in an era before um, uh, internet um, existed in a way that benefits short-term rentals and allowed people to um, book these things remotely and access them remotely, perhaps without even ever meeting the, the owner or their representative. Um, and it's also, this also was written in an era when there were many fewer permits. Each month we have that the, the program grows by, um, it grows by a couple dozen permits a year at this point. So the, the, pro, the number of permits we manage is growing and um, our mechanisms for enforcement have not, to our way of thinking, kept up. So we're looking to shorten that enforcement chain um, down to a smaller number of violations before we result in a, um, in a revocation. That was a pretty clear direction from the council on that point, that we needed a, a, a more streamlined method to get to revocation rather than the older method we had. Um, the other thing that happened is we've changed the way we do audits. Most of the violations that we find in audits that result in um, that kind of enforcement action are, are primarily related to the 14-day requirement, the calendar requirement. If you want me to explain the nuances of that requirement, I'm going to turn to Alicia, who actually understands it. I barely understand it myself. 
it's a complicated uh, piece of our code. Um, but when we do audit um, those particular 14 day permits, the first time we did a comprehensive audit, we found a large, large number of violations. I think that almost all of those were unintentional, resulting from what I just said, the complexity of our code. Um, and the follow-up audit we just completed resulted in many fewer violations. So that actually has had a, a good effect on those permit holders and on us from an enforcement point of view. Um, but nonetheless, the uh, city's attorney with the support of the council wants to see a, a, a quicker path to um, revocation. They don't want to eliminate the provisions that involve a warning and a suspension, but they do want us to get to revocation on um, repeat habitual offenders where they exist. The other thing um, that I think is a substantive change from, from our point of view and from the point of view of, uh, I think, the management companies, there are people from management companies here that can speak to this. They might tell me I'm all wet, but I'm going to say it anyway. Um, we're looking to change the way we renew permits. We renew permits now at the fiscal new year, July 1st, and that means we're reviewing, uh, renewing 200 and some odd permits in a very compressed time frame that um, is, um, well, they're, they're all bunched up at once. They're all bunched up at the busiest time of the year for us. And they're also at the busiest time of the year for those management companies. Um, and that's been a, a, a bad situation because we can't process them fast enough to um, satisfy really our own requirements and the needs and wants of the permit holders and the management companies. Because like I said, they are this is the time of year when they actually make money doing this. They're booking people, and we can't get these permits out, uh, quite, quite turn them around fast enough. So what we're looking to do is uh, change that, which that, and that's hardwired into our code, change that so that we can renew these permits. If you apply for a permit today, and we uh, grant it uh, next month, um, the way it works now is you'd have your permit um, February, March through June, and then we have to renew it again, even though you paid whole, whole years worth of fees. What I'd like to do is if we grant you a permit in March, then we won't renew it again until next March. Now, the question of how we're going to decouple the vast majority of our permits, which are already tied to the fiscal new year, is a, an interesting one. When I've talked to the city manager and finance director about this, when we do the new year's, the resolution, the renewals this year is to just figure out a way of um, allowing people who have got their forms in early and on time to, instead of just giving them a 12 month renewal, give them a 14 or 16 month renewal as a, as a reward for helping us get it in on time and just to get them off of that, um, that synchronization with the new year. That also requires a change to our business license um, requirement. That's not something that goes through the planning commission. That'll be something that we tack on at the end of this if this is successful. So I think that would, I know that benefits us at the staff end, and I think it benefits um, the uh, management companies uh, to some extent too by uh, flattening out their workload, uh, at least the part of the workload that we're responsible for. So those are two substantive parts of this. There are other changes though. We're changing the names of things. Um, we're uh, taking, we took some language out of there and, um, that really is uh, administrative in nature. Um, those have, have an impact. Um, with that, I want to turn to at least one of the comment letters you got um, from uh, Bill Allred, whose uh, firm owns a number of units that are in the short-term pool. Um, and you talk about the 14-day. Yeah, the 14-day okay. pool. Although, isn't that what it's called now? Well, there's several <laughs> pools. I don't know which ones his are in. It doesn't matter for purposes of this letter. <laughs> yeah, he manages them. He's, it's a trust that owns them. Yeah. Um, the, uh, his letter, uh, which was uh, sent to Alicia and I, um, dated Wednesday, um, indicates that he felt that the notice was inadequate on this. And um, I, I don't didn't feel it was, but I uh, confirmed that with our attorney. We're we're good on the notice on here. I wanted to tell you how we did notify this. For starters, it's a legislative matter. The notice for legislative matters is, is completely different than quasi-judicial matters like the Cambridge Beach Academy. Um, but instead of just following our minimal requirements, I also notified all of the management companies that we do, do business with, which is about seven or eight or nine of them, plus all 200 and some odd permit holders, um, which we are not required to do. But I felt this was clearly something that affected them 
I already have this mailing list for them, so why not do that? So we went, I, we actually went overboard on notification on this, um, but uh, from uh, Mr. Allred's comments notwithstanding, we're, we certainly meet our requirements on notice for this. I think we exceed them. Um, so uh, if you want us to do a different kind of notice, let me know. But um, for purposes of this legislative amendment, we've gone well past what our code and state law requires. Um, with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions about the amendments, or um, they may come up during testimony and if you want to answer and ask them then. A question. Um, I noticed that a lot of the letters are dealing with the whole substance of the 14 yeah. day requirement. My understanding is that's already been, in fact, it was even, I think it was even litigated at one point, the whole idea of that and the and that is the way we do it now. And is this hearing, my understanding that, that this hearing is just to address the um, procedural and uh, um, issues with the changes yeah. and, and not to go back and reiterate all the complaints about the 14-day thing because that already is something that, this isn't the place to do that. that well, it's already been decided. I have good news and bad news for you on that front. <laughs> Uh, the good news is that this is not part of that package, um, and if uh, I would, I would urge you not to. If I mean, people testify may urge you to make that kind of a change. I would ask you not to recommend that to the council at this point because we didn't advertise it that way. And if you add some really substantive changes that are outside the scope of what we originally proposed, um, then you probably end up having to re-advertise it in, in a way that's fairly costly. This, that's the good news. The second part is the not so good news. I think that there's very likely to be at the direction of the council a more substantive set of changes to this uh, ordinance coming to you sometime in, let's say, the summer. Um, once the council has uh, held some work sessions and made some, some, given us some guidance on that. They have had a lot of discussions at the council level about uh, do we want to make changes to we have essentially three permit programs. There's the grandfather permits, the five-year, what are called five-year unlimited permits in here, and these 14-day permits. Um, and they, uh, I don't have a clear direction yet from the council on what they want to see in terms of any or all of those programs. But the one thing I do know is that they're all interested in it and talking about it, and we're, we have subsequent work sessions scheduled with them, so I can get some direction. If I do get some direction from them on how to proceed, that will be yet another amendment that comes back to you. But I'd like to keep it separate from these, this package here, um, so that we don't get kind of the two confused. These are procedural things for the most part that the county, that the city's attorney wants us to uh, uh, adopt. That second package really are kind of bigger policy questions and substantive changes that the council might direct us to do. Yes, you're right, there was litigation on this um, a, a number of years ago um, that established in, in a, kind of an indirect way the city's ability to do this. Hannah Beach, I think, is the first city in Oregon to adopt short-term rental regulations. Um, and it, it flew out of that, um, uh, it grew out of that litigation that um, went our way at the Supreme Court. Um, it was well before my tenure here, but um, yes, you're right, that was litigated and decided already. But the wrong, the city council may well want to revisit that, which is their right to do. Mm -hmm. That was an awful long answer to your question. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm curious about something you know, I hadn't really brought up that you said, if I understood, that I hadn't brought up to you before. You were saying that the, the number of permits is growing from, from year to year. What's the mechanism of that? And why? The, 14 the, the 14 day permits. The, 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 the other two parts of it, the grandfather permits and the five year permits, are capped by code. Um, that, so that doesn't grow. That stays the same. The number, uh, as time goes by, the number of grandfather permits drop, but they are made up. They, those permits essentially get shoved into the five-year you know, program. Have a 14-day issue. Well, the 14-day permits are, are not capped. So they, everybody who meets our requirements and asks for one gets one. And that number increases by, I think the last month it increased by four. I, I, I write this monthly report to the city council on that. I should have provided it to you, but it, it grows every month. Um, it doesn't decline, or it hasn't declined in my tenure here. And, and people do drop out of that program, don't get me wrong. Houses get sold, people's plans change. So they, we, people do uh, give up their 14-day permit, but the number of new permits is greater than that number we lose each year. So that, 
that part of the program grows um, slowly each year. Uh, the, the total of all of our short-term rent permits, most of them are in 14 days, um, is, is slightly in excess of 10% of our housing stock now. So it's, it's a growing program. It grows faster than our housing stock at this point. In the letter from uh, the Coosters, they, they're commenting about why assign an arbitrary start date um, to each of the 14 day periods. Are you, are you going by the first of the month and the fourth? Um, no. The, I, the rental. First yeah. day they start renting. The yeah. It's the, but it sounded to me from. Oh, well, okay. It, it's. Um, it's uh, I'll, if you want to delve into this, I'd be happy to. You won't be happy forever having answered the question, though. Um, it's really complicated. You really need a calendar in front of you to kind of figure this out. Um, Picasso, one of the, the management companies here, tried to hardwire this into their computer code, into their automatic reservation system, and um, their uh, manager told me they spent hundreds of programmer hours trying to write that as computer code and um, managed to get it wrong on one of their um, rentals. And, uh, Is that one thing that council, city council is thinking about modifying? Yeah, we've, there's been, there's always, there's constant talk about changing that 14 day requirement to make it less complex and easier to understand. Um, I, I met with the um, management company reps uh, earlier this week and we, we talked about this issue. Um, and I, I don't know if I said it to them, but I've said it before. I think there's several groups of people on the 14-day permit. There are the management companies understand it at this point. They have a, a good grasp on it. They know exactly what they need. We rarely get violations of that from the management companies. The, the self-managed units, which are something like half of the units, roughly round figures, um, that's where most of many of those 14-day um, violations come from. And of that group, there's kind of there's uh, self-managed people who understand the rules really well. There are self-managed people who don't understand the rules at all. And then there, I think there's a small number of people who have violations and claim to not understand the rules, but probably really do. Um, <laughs> it, it's, it's, a, it's a change that we can make, um, but it's, it's not part of this agenda in front of you tonight. Okay. Um, and I'd really like to keep it separate, but keep it in mind, because if that, well, that's one of the changes the council has discussed. Let's figure out a way of making that simpler. I, I came up with a, a, a draft of some alternative wording for, for the way I think they would like it. Yeah. That, that didn't seem very com complicated or hard. To no, there are. Obviously, that's not business for tonight. Yeah, business there are other ways of doing this that you could, I think you could simplify that language without substantively changing the intent of that 14-day um, requirement. But it's not in front of you tonight, um, but may well be at a future date. Yeah, I don't think it's complicated at all. I really don't. You want to go into the business? <laughs> it just makes sense to me. Uh, any further questions for, for Mark before we uh, move ahead? Any additional correspondence besides what we've already seen? Yeah, the packet in front of you is it. Got it. Okay. This is a call for public testimony. The pertinent criteria to be considered are noted in the staff reports and listed on the criteria sheets. Next to the West Door. Testimony, arguments, and evidence must be directed toward those criteria or other criteria in the comprehensive plan or municipal code which the person testifying believes to apply to the decision. Failure to raise an issue accompanied by statements or evidence sufficient to afford the decision maker and the parties an opportunity to respond to the issue precludes appeal based on that issue. Persons who testify shall first receive recognition from the chair, state their full name and mailing address, and if appearing in a representative capacity, identify whom they represent. But whom they represent. Are there presentations by proponents of the request? Not everybody speaking. <laughs> no, not okay. Are there presentations of opponents of the request? People just came to hear. Okay. Uh, I, that surprises me. No staff response <laughs> at this point, I guess. Well, it surprised me too. Um, I, I guess there's two things I'd, I'd add to, to what I said earlier. What, 
if there really is no oral testimony, you, you maybe perhaps can conclude business tonight. There's no rush on this. I don't have this hard schedule for the city council at this point. So um, I, I had assumed that it would take you at least two meetings to get through this, but maybe I was wrong. Um, so if you feel like you just want more time to digest it, or if there's additional information you want from us, or if you just want a chance to hear more testimony from people who are too shy to speak tonight, there, I don't think there's any harm in you continuing this. But if you want to get business done tonight and move on, you can too. Well, I, I think one of the reasons maybe we're not hearing from people tonight is because it isn't about the substance. Substance of the, the yeah. that's where we yeah. hear from people. I'm sure there's going to be tons of people speaking on that. That's what these letters address. Yeah. Since that's not the issue tonight. Yeah, you know, because it's every time I've ever spent at the council meeting. Yeah. Yeah, I, I will say, uh, I, I went through this, I, and I apologize for the fact that I ended up doing it today. I had the idea that it was going to be pretty trivial and ended up probably making about 20 or 30, mostly sort of <laughs> minor uh, punctuation and uh, uh, Changes which I think are, are worth incorporating. Uh, if it's if there's essentially no cost to it to the system, I'd like to hold up until we can uh, I give those to you, and you can and we can just get them out to everybody on the, on the commission can look and say, okay, yeah, that's that's trivial, or that, that this may be trivial, but let's do it the other way. Let's do it that. Yeah, we can do that if you um, actually you or anybody on the commission wants to get. It. Request for more information or some some thoughts on wording. Uh, get them to me, and I can get you a, a draft for your next meeting. And you can either close the hearing tonight or keep it open however you want to do it. Any, any objections to doing that? I, I don't want to ram down people's throats. As long as long as we got this, as long as we offered the opportunity to do this. Uh, I apologize for not doing it in time to, to get it out to everybody before now. You know, I, I think given given how uh, potentially explosive all of this can be, uh, as I witnessed when uh, this whole process started in the nineties, um, I guess I would I would really uh, think leaving this open for our next month's hearing mm -hmm. so people who have, happen to come forward. I'd feel more comfortable if there were more people you know, complaining about this. <laughs> 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 Get out there and do some work. I, just, no, I don't think, I mean, I don't understand that because I understand that people are going to complain about the statute. No, I, no, I understand what you're talking about. But this is just, this is wording. It's, a, it's changing the three categories of names of those kinds of things. I guess the way I look at it is if we're going to come back to it anyway, why not just be open with the public and let them speak if they want to? Chances are all of these will be back here you know, no, next I week think just because we're so interesting. <laughs> in some way, though, if we keep it open and we do another public notice that we indicate that this is more process than substantial changes because these people came here. Yeah. Um, yeah, we will notify. Um, it goes. It's not publicly notified on our website and then through the agenda process. Because I already have a mailing list of permit holders and management companies, I could certainly notify all of them uh, about your plans and how this is continuing. And there, there will be a forum for people to address the substantive changes when the council takes it up. Assuming they do, yes. Yeah. Yeah. And right. I'll so. put that in there. That okay. Somehow, that you know, mm -hmm. there will be. Okay. The substantive changes discussed at the city council later on. Are we going to have any discussion between us tonight about this? Well, uh, if, if anybody has something that they want to discuss. I do. Yeah, I, I do. Um, on, on the attachment C, mm -hmm. on the lifetime unlimited permit, remind me what page that's on. Well, it's page one, attachment C. Attachment C is it's the, 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 chart. the chart, the side by side oh, thing. Oh, okay. So I'm yeah. on, on page three, the current and then the proposed definition of sale or transfer. My, to me, it seems um, we're talking about um, 
survivorship with a spouse or transfer from owner staff to the trust, which benefits only the spouse for the spouse's lifetime and lifetime transfer between spouses. The permit holder may transfer ownership of real property to the trustee of the liability company, corporation, partnership, a limited partnership, a limited liability partnership, and similar entities, and not be subject to permit the revocable pursuit of this section as long as the transfer lives and remains the only owner of the entity. Then the last sentence, upon the transfer of its death or the sale or transfer of his or her interest in the entity to another person, the short-term rental permit held in all or part by the transfer shall be void. I don't understand, especially in my case, does that mean that the permit that I have is void if it's not under one of those categories? No. Your business is not in the short-term rental regulation. But the way this thing is worded, it sounds... You're not subject to this in your business because you don't have a short-term rental permit. You're a hotel that's in a commercial zone. Well, I'm just looking at... I mean, I'm considered a lifetime unlimited permit. Is that... No. You're allowed outright in that zone. Okay. Oh, okay. Strangely enough... Oh, were you done? Yeah, I'm done. Okay. I have some things on that same spot, and that was, I was going to suggest, in that last sentence, changing from the beginning of the third to the last line, the entity to a person other than the spouse, because the entity to another person, to me, was not clear who, other than the person dying, or what? Let me give you a bit of background on this particular section. The reason I can is because I spent an hour on the phone with Tammy yesterday talking about it. She had spent multiple hours talking with an attorney for one of the permit holders about it, so I think they parsed every one of these words out for as many small pieces as they could. I think the intent here... This applies to the grandfathered permits. The intent is that the people who own those permits, when they became grandfathered, we essentially made a promise to them that they could keep this thing going as long as they were alive and the surviving spouse could get it. But if it started being sold, we didn't want to get into a situation where those permits, the properties were essentially sold with the permits intact for the grandfathered parcels, or the grandfathered dwellings. The whole thing about the trusts and the different entities is a lawyerly way of trying to parse that, what I just said, into a lot longer chain of words to cover a lot of weird circumstances. The one we talked about the other day, we talked about two of them, but one of them had to do with a trust that was established and the trustee was dying, or it was already died, I'm not sure. The beneficiaries of the trust are now looking to transfer that into another ownership package. There's a way of doing that, but the problem always comes in when people try to add new owners into the mix. So if the owners die, it's generally not a problem, but when new owners are brought in, then it violates this, or at least our understanding of how it reads. That came up last year or the year before, I can't remember now, where a trustee, the trust party died and they decided to bring in a grandchild or some other relative to that party and made them an owner on that deed. By bringing in the new guy, they screwed it up, they lost the deed, or they didn't lose the deed, they still own the house, but they lost the permit because that was a new party to the property. People dying would have been fine if they had just kept it alone. We had a little conversation. I'm making this sound like a Dickens novel, it's not, but it's complicated and I think the wordiness of this is an attempt to capture all of those different permutations of that. This is really a different, it's outside of that though. It was the intent, what I just said, the entity to another person is supposed to mean the entity to a person other than the spouse. It seems like that was probably the intent, but it wasn't clear. And then I have another question right there, 
happens. Let's say I have a permit. I die. My wife gets the permit. What happens if she marries? Does it get remarries? That's a, so. The, that's an interesting question, and the reason I know the answer is because it comes up. <laughs> so. Uh, um, um, Mr. and Mrs. Lundy own the house that the permit is issued for. Mr. Lundy dies. She owns the house by right of um, survivorship. And um, that's the permit is good. Right up to the point where she remarries, it's still good. And it, the way, place where it falls apart is if she puts her new husband's name on the deed. So okay, if, but if she doesn't, if she on, doesn't, if it's still owned by then, then that person doesn't get it by survivorship. Right. She dies. Right. Okay. So mm -hmm. it, so it doesn't yeah. go past. So her. she could keep it. That's, she could keep that permit alive as long as she didn't add her new husband to the deed. Okay. You believe this program to die out? Don't you? <laughs> well, that's the actually literally the intent is to amortize out those grandfathered permits okay. because I, I that was the whole point of it. Is, as long as we're putting all of this other stuff in there. I'll, that explicitly well, there. I'll bring it up with Tammy and see okay. if she can uh, see see if the, unless there's some reason for the way she yeah. lawyerly worded that. Um, yeah, it, it makes sense to me. Okay, I, I apologize for I, I hadn't meant to, to dump a, <laughs> this stuff out, but I just jumped on it because Hank had brought up that, that particular sentence. I just think it's actually that really a really good job. I mean, I think that the new, the new, three, the new names for the three categories make complete sense. I never understood the old one, and now this one, it was like, oh, okay, that's what they meant. And it really, I, I just think that she did an excellent job of, of clearing it up. Great. Right. I'll pass that on. Okay, are we agreed that this is going to be continued to? next month and will be held open for both written and oral testimony. Any objections to that? And I would re-notify the same people I've notified for this. Thank you. Now, uh, I've actually got a, an email made up to send to you and Alicia left a phone call saying that I'm prepared to do that. But, so I'll just send it to you. That'd be great. If it's not yeah. clear, I'll probably drop by and go through that. Okay. Uh, then, that matter is done for now. Are there any... Is there any matters of oh, any trees? Well, we need you to author a uh, motion to authorize the oh, chair to sign yes. the order for CBA. Should have had patience to find my agenda. Uh, is there a motion to authorize the chair to sign? Are we going to do? Yeah, we have an appropriate order. We had an order to, to, to sign the appropriate orders. I still move. Second? Second. Sorry. Commissioner Bennett? Yes. Commissioner Kerr? Yes. Commissioner Johnson? Yes. Commissioner Risley? Yes. Commissioner Burke? Yes. Commissioner Patrick? Yes. Chair Lundy? Yes. Uh, I don't know. Should we get it for your report? Yeah, we did. It should be on the tail end of your packet. I think I didn't put down that part. Okay. Any comments on the tree report? I'm going planning that. Two items that I want to bring to your attention. One is, um, it, it seems like I'm always, we just finished one and start the next, but the ethics, um, your ethics um, reports are going to be due sometime in April, I think April 15th. Um, Colleen will be sending that material out to you, um, but it's all on, on you to get it filed in time. Uh, I know you've all done it in the past, so I. Those are all online now, right? Yeah, it's okay. all electronic. Um, but. Um, if, when those do, I'll alert you specifically when they come out. But it's it's coming out here um, April 15th. I think is when they do. The other thing is um, uh, the mayor uh, Sam Stidell is is probably going to convene a meeting of all of our board and commission chairs and vice chairs sometime this winter to just talk about procedures, um, things like that. This commission is is not a, a problem because our procedures are pretty hardwired and. and Generally, don't have problems following them, but he wants to just make sure all of our um, 
uh, board and commission chair per persons are, are, are aware of what their obligations are. Um, and since we're doing this at the new year, some of those commissions have new uh, chair people. So that, that's coming up. You'll be notified probably directly from the mayor on that. That's all I have. Uh, any go to the order? Sure. Thanks very much.